This message series has all been all about remembering the hope, the peace, and the joy, and the love that we have because of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's entry into the world. Amen. Um, and last Sunday, I wasn't feeling too confident because uh, OG just <laughs> ran all up and through my text. Amen. Um, but I'm going to go um, and come back and hopefully um, continue where he left off. Amen. So join me in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. And let's start in verse 8. Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 8. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. <laughs> and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Let's read verse 15 again. This is our focus today. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Let's end this message series talking about tis the season of victory. Come on, put it in the chat. Tis the season of victory. Amen. Out of the four virtues that Pastor Brandon gave us, hope, peace, joy, and love, all of these we have because of Christ's entry into the world, I want to focus on hope today. For those who may not know, Genesis 3 is the account of the tragic fall of man. And oftentimes, hope is difficult to perceive. It's difficult to grasp in the midst of tragic situations, particularly ones that are the result of our own disobedience. And yet in my study of the tragic fall of man in Genesis 3, I see hope. I see a hope that with the assistance of the rest of the scriptures, it becomes fully realized for what it truly is. And this hope, somebody say this hope, this hope culminates in victory. Genesis 3, our main protagonist, we have Adam, we have Eve, we have the triune God. Catch, with, catch that with me. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all here in the garden. Amen? And then we have our antagonist, the serpent. Now, if you just read Genesis 3, there's no way um, to um, look at the text and explicitly say that the serpent is being possessed by Satan. Satan's name is not mentioned. However, in Revelation, John tells us that the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And so the serpent here in our text, this is Satan possessing a creature that God has made, possessing the serpent. And so let's track in Genesis 3 real quick before we get to verse um, 15. So Satan... Begins by asking Eve the question, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Notice how he uses a distorted version of God's commandment. God's commandment said from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. And here goes Satan, indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? He purposely distorts God's original commandment to bait Eve to see if she was really paying attention. And so here go Eve. Here goes Eve. 
from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, we don't know where she got that you can't touch it part. Um, Because God said in Genesis 2, 16, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Here goes Satan in verse 4. You will not surely die. Now God told Adam, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. But here he goes, he refutes God's assertion that they will die upon eating from this tree. He, called, he calls God a liar. Now, ain't that something? That Satan calls God a liar. God tells him, if you eat from this forbidden tree, you will die. Here goes Satan. You will not surely die. There's a red flag right there. That should have set something off in Eve's head. If God is telling me that I'm going to die if I eat from this tree, but you telling me that I'm not, there's a red flag here. And here goes Satan again. He insinuates to Eve that God forbid the both of you from eating from this tree because he doesn't want you to become like him. He says, for in that day, God says, God knows that in that day you eat from the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, here's the thing. God made Eve and Adam in his image according to his likeness. But conversely, Adam and Eve would have never been able to obtain full likeness with God because God made them. God made them. And God is not made. He just is. He is the great I am. He always was. And so God is not made. God had to make Adam and Eve, the uncreated creator, making creation. And so they were never going to be able to be fully like God, but in the sense of knowing good and evil, the only way they were going to be able to obtain that is by committing evil. The only way they would have gained knowledge of good and evil is by committing evil. How is that? God is omniscient. He's holy. He is sinless. He cannot be tempted by evil. So his knowledge of good and evil originates from his omniscience, not from any experience in committing evil. In contrast, the only way that Adam and Eve were going to be able to acquire the knowledge of evil is by experience, by committing evil, which they did when they disobeyed God's command to not eat from the forbidden tree. If you have to disobey God in order to obtain the thing that you desire, that desire is not worth having. I said, if you have to disobey God in order to obtain the thing that you desire, that desire is not worth having. It's here in the text. In order to obtain the knowledge of evil, she had to commit evil. She had to purposely, intently rebel against God in order to obtain that knowledge of good and evil. And when she obtained it, she couldn't even enjoy it because shame and fear had entered into it. And because... She rebelled. Because she rebelled, now they are shameful to even go up to God. They're shameful. They hide from God. The thing that she desired, she couldn't even enjoy. It brought her sorrow because she obtained it illegally. If you have to disobey him to obtain the thing that you desire, it's not worth having. It's not going to come without consequences. It's not going to come without sorrow because you purposely rebelled against God. And so here we go, having contemplating Satan's words, Eve turns her attention to the tree. And she notices characteristics about it that she didn't previously notice but were always, always present. See, that garden, every tree in that garden was good for food. Every tree in that garden was a, dis, a delight to the eyes. But now she's looking at it from another perspective because Satan has planted seeds of doubt. He's made her to believe that God is keeping something from you. He makes Eve question God's motives. And so now she looks at the tree. And even though God tells her that eating from it will kill you, now she justifies her desire to pursue it because it looks good. She justifies her desire to go eat from it because it, the, food, the fruit is pleasing. She justifies her reason to go after the tree because it's desirable to make one wise, even though God said it would kill her. Don't you know that the things that God tells you know, a lot of the times those are the things that look most attractive to you. 
A lot of the things that God restricts from you, he says not to go to, those things are going to look nice. They're going to be pleasurable to the eyes. They're going to be pleasurable to make you wise. They're going to be pleasurable to satisfy you. But if he says no, you need to trust in the motives and the intent of a holy, sinless God. You need to trust in his intent. But more importantly, he knows better than you. He knows the consequences. See, this is how Satan deceived her. He told her that you are not going to incur consequences from your disobedience. You are not going to incur consequences from your disobedience. If you eat from this tree, you'll be like God. You'll be like him in knowing good and evil. He did not tell her that you would be shameful. He did not tell her that now the fellowship between you and God would be broken. And so this is what happens. Satan told a half truth. Adam and Eve's eyes did, in fact, open. They did, in fact, become like God in the sense of knowing good and evil. But he still lied to her because he said you wouldn't die. And as soon as they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they died. Now, how are you saying, Dominique, how they died? They're still living. Spiritually, they died. Yeah. The fellowship that they enjoyed with the Father, they would walk around with him in the cool of the day, but that fellowship was now broken because sin had now entered into the world, and then they slowly began to die physically. Somebody say, God is not a liar. God is not a liar. Death at the core is separation. And I want to ask you, Is what you're pursuing outside of God's will, is it worth the consequences? Is it worth the sorrow? Is it worth everything that comes along with it? Disobedience, you will not disobey God and not incur consequences. Consequences are going to come with it. Even God told them, you will die. But obviously that wasn't enough. His command to them was sufficient. He said, do not eat from this tree or you will die. And yet that command was still not sufficient for obedience. And so here we have it. We live in a world now where sickness and disease and natural disasters plague this earth. Why? Because man did not trust God. Man did not trust his intentions. Man did not trust that his intents and his motives for them were pure. And so now here we have it, a world full of sin. So after confronting Adam and Eve, God begins to dispense judgment against all three guilty parties. Amen? Because Adam and Eve were responsible. They were fully responsible for what they did. But Satan was also responsible. Because he planted the seeds. He deceived Eve. And so Genesis 3, down to uh, Genesis 3, 14, he begins to dispense judgment against the serpent. Now, this judgment against the serpent was twofold. In verse 14, you see judgment against the serpent as an animal, as a reptile. But then verse 15, this is where we see judgment against Satan, the power possessing the serpent. Now, I know you're saying, Dominique, this message says, this message is called, Tis the, Tis the Season of Victory. Where's the victory? And this pronouncement of judgment against Satan is what many scholars call the proto-evangelium, the first proclamation of the good news. In his pronouncement of judgment against Satan, there is yet hope. It is the good news. It is the proto-evangelium. It is the first proclamation of the gospel. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. I asked God in my study, I said, God, now the scripture says that you put it there. You put enmity between the serpent and the woman. And I asked God, why did you do that? I had to look at this verse, and it says in verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent. He's pronouncing judgment against the serpent. So if he's pronouncing judgment against the serpent, that whatever, whatever he's dispensing to the serpent is going to serve as a disadvantage to Satan. Let's take it back to Ezekiel. God casted Lucifer out of heaven due to his pride, and one-third of the angel population left with him. And so now Satan has created beings in alliance with him to oppose heaven. Now all he needs is the alliance of humanity. But how does Satan acquire the alliance and the cooperation of humanity in his opposition against God? 
he must deceive them into forfeiting the authority that God gave them and commanded them to exercise. The only way this authority can be forfeited is if they disobey God, which is exactly what happened. So here we go. Satan assumes the form of the serpent, a creature that God had made, and he takes advantage of the civility and the harmony between humanity and the animals in the garden. There was no hostility. Can you imagine being in the garden going up against lions and tigers and bears and just there's no hostility there. I mean, it's just all civility. We're able to coexist. And so Satan takes the form of the serpent, as crafty as he is, and he goes and he finds Eve goes and finds Eve. And this explains why Eve was so comfortable in talking to the serpent. We have to remember that the serpent that we know it to be today is not what it was prior to the fall. That was part of the curse of Genesis 14. Cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast on your belly you will go. That's why we see serpents crawling on their belly and dust you will eat all the days of your life. The serpent that we know it to be today did not look like didn't look like what it was today, didn't look like that prior to the fall. And so Eve is conversing with the serpent. There's comfortability there, there's civility, there's harmony. So she's not picking up that he's trying to deceive her. And so the civility there, the lack of enmity, the absence of that enmity, it opened up the door for Eve to engage, to entertain, and to ultimately yield to Satan's deception. He's crafty. That's why I said the serpent is more crafty than any of the beasts because Satan had possessed that. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, they forfeited that authority that God had given them. He said, I've given you authority over all man, all the creatures on this earth. I've given you authority to subdue them. And because they did not exercise authority over this serpent, now here we have here, authority forfeited. And by default, man becomes subjected to the power and the lordship of Satan. We become members of his kingdom. So here's God. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, Satan, because this was all a part of God's plan to interrupt Satan's greater plan, to form an alliance with humanity against God himself. Don't you know that Satan is trying to take as many people to hell with him as possible? He's trying to form armies. He's trying to gather all the people necessary to go up against, go to, go up against heaven. And he says, I need humanity. I need God's greatest creation. I need them in alliance with me to oppose the work of heaven. And so God says, Satan, you're not going to get them. I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. Because this is going to establish a resistance between the two of you. So that Eve, this would enable Eve to resist your attempts. Ain't God good that even in the midst of Eve's disobedience, he puts enmity to protect her. He realizes that Eve, I know that you failed. I know that you failed to deceive. But I'm putting enmity between you and the serpent so you don't have to fall short again. So you don't have to fall to the deception of the serpent again. He says, I am going to put enmity between you, Satan and the woman to interrupt your plans to make them harder because I have a plan for humanity. I know you have plans for them. I know you have plans to use them for your purposes, but I have a plan. It's called redemption. And so here we go. It says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. This enmity would continue between Satan and Eve's seed or offspring. Now this seed Man, so much controversy um, in the scholarly Christian realm over whether or not this denotes one descendant or a line of descendants. Because the Greek, excuse me, the Hebrew word for seed functions as both a singular noun and a collective noun or a group. And so what we have here, the big question is, is that is Satan's seed in this verse singular and is the woman's seed in this verse singular? For those who say that Satan's seed is singular, they point to the Antichrist who comes during the tribulation period to deceive people and to take people to hell with him and Satan. For some people, when they look at the seed in terms of Satan, the collective sense, they think of the devil's angels, his demons, the fallen angels that have joined him in his rebellion. And of course, all those who willingly serve the devil. In John 8, 44, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. That one was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand firm in truth because the truth is not in him. When he speaks the lie, he speaks from his own nature. He says, you Pharisees, you are of the father, your devil. 
You are of the Father. You are of your father, the devil. And then the singular use of seed, when it comes to Eve, this is what points to Jesus Christ. This is what points to the promised seed that comes and fulfills the prophecy later in this verse. But the collective use also involves all of humanity. Eve is the mother of all living. And so here we have it. This seed, this her seed, this seed, the seed of the woman, based on this contextual verse, based on the context of this verse, this is pointing to Jesus Christ. And then in Christ is his body. And so here, the pronoun that immediately follows her seed, in some translations it says it, other says he, but this is how we know that this promised seed is one descendant. This seed is one descendant, and it points to Jesus Christ. Now, how is that? Well, we know that this is the seed of a woman, so we know that this seed is human. And this points to how Jesus adds humanity to his deity, how he is fully God and fully man, how he is the God man. He's not just man. He's not just God. He is the God man. It points to to the fact that Jesus is a male. Amen. And you shall bruise his heel. Come on, somebody read his heel. So Jesus is male. He is man. He is the God man. And Luke 3, we see the genealogy of Jesus tracing back to Seth. And who is Seth? Seth is the son, the third son of Adam and Eve. So Jesus is, in fact, the seed of the woman, Eve. And so here we go, the battle. The battle, the battle, the battle between Satan and the woman's seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Where is the victory in this verse? All I see is he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In this pronouncement, God uses the same word to describe the manner of affliction against both opponents. Bruise, which means to overwhelm, which means to strike, in some contexts to crush. So who's doing the crushing? Where is the victory? How do we know that Jesus ultimately wins? It matters where you aim. I don't know if anybody watches boxing, but there are certain places where you box and you aim, the impact of that hit cause that man to fall down and go to the floor. So it matters where you hit. It matters where you aim that punch. And so here we go. He shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. A serpent's venom is produced in its head. He shall bruise your head, but you shall bruise his heel. The bruise to the head is fatal. The bruise to his heel is not fatal. The bruise to the serpent's head is fatal. The bruise to Jesus' heel is not fatal. Satan only bruised Jesus' heel through his torture and his crucifixion. And please hear me out. I'm not saying that the pain that he endured was not great. He was tortured. He was brutalized. He was tortured even before he got on the cross. And then when he got on the cross, he was tortured. Some more blood and water was rushing out of his body. So he was tortured. He was bleeding. He was losing water. He was gasping for air. The pain and the suffering that he endured was serious. And it was painful. But in comparison to what he did to Satan, it did not compare. He said he was bruised for our our iniquities. He carried our pain. We assumed him stricken. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Those wounds that he experienced were real and they were painful. But Jesus fatally bruised. That's why we say he crushed him. Because that bruise to the head was fatal. How was it fatal? Because in crushing the serpent's head, Jesus renders Satan powerless of his dominion over death. Show them Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, therefore, Hebrews 2, 14, therefore, since these his children share in flesh and blood, he himself in a similar manner also shared in the same nature so that through death, He had to die, that through his death he might make powerless, that he might make ineffective, that he might make impotent him who had the power of death. That is the devil. 
and that he might free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in slavery throughout their lives. Don't you understand that the devil had everybody under his dominion, he had them under the fear of death because this separation of death separated us from our fellowship with the Father. But here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus rendering him powerless, saying to those who believe in me, the power of death no longer reigns over them. You don't have to be afraid to die. You don't have to be afraid to be separated from this body because if you believe in my name, in my presence you shall be the moment you leave this body he says i render you powerless you can't torment my people you can't torment those who call upon my name for salvation you cannot afflict them with the fear of death because once they leave this body they come live with me once they live with this body they don't come and live with you they come and reign for me for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever might believe in him shall not what perish but have eternal life life reigns over me now because of the son life reigns over me Jesus is my Lord death is no longer my Lord Satan is no longer my Lord Jesus this is my Lord, and because he's Lord over my life, I have life eternal. Somebody would say, but didn't Jesus die? So wasn't the bruise to his heel fatal? Jesus did die, but his, the bruise to his heel wasn't fatal because Jesus didn't stay dead. Come on, somebody. He said, destroy this temple in three days, and I will raise it back up again. His death was not fatal. It didn't end in death. It ended in resurrection. It ended in ascension. He died, but he didn't stay dead. On the contrary, Satan no longer has power over death to those who believe. Jesus says that I have rendered him powerless. Don't you know when they, God does a thing, it's final, it's permanent, it's no going back on it. He says, I've rendered you powerless, Satan. So to those who come to him in salvation, you have power in him. You have life eternal in him. The bruise to your head, Satan. The part where the venom is produced and lodged. I crushed your head and so now your venom has no power to those to those who believe, to those who believe. This is why 1 Corinthians, I love it, Paul. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? I can't find your victory anywhere. I don't see it anywhere. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? To the believer, death has no sting. Death has no effect on me. If anything, Paul said that to, to live is for Christ and to die is gain. I only gain when I die. I only gain when I leave this body. So where is your victory, death? Where is it? I know for a lot of people, some of you are hurting right now because you're plagued by death. But if you are a believer, if your loved one was a believer, death has no victory over them. You're looking at a body in the casket, but they're up there in heaven. There is no victory. A lot of times when we're looking at the casket, we think that they lost. You lost your battle with cancer. You lost your battle with diabetes. You lost your battle. But to the believer, there is no loss, only victory. We need to keep walking up to the casket, to the loved ones who have died in Christ and say, you have not lost you have won you have won because he has won to the believer you have not lost you have only gained you have only gained you have not lost anything second corinthians but thanks be to god who always causes us in every circumstance in every trouble in every trial always causes us to triumph in who christ jesus don't you understand that the victory is in Christ Jesus, that the triumph is in Christ Jesus? Everything that we have is in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine Eve having been deceived by the enemy and fallen, thinking that all was lost, and yet God, in the midst of this pronouncement of judgment upon the serpent, gives them hope. Eve, your seed will bruise, serp will bruise Satan's head. He shall only bruise his heel, but your seed will bruise his head. Your seed, you still have a role to play in my plan, Eve. I know that Satan deceived you. I know that you and Adam are now the cause of sin entering into the world, but I still have use for you. I still have use in my redemptive plan for you to usher in through your loins the seed, the seed that will crush the serpent's head. This is the proto-evangelium. In Genesis, the first 
good news. See, I know a lot of the times we wait until Easter, we wait until Resurrection Sunday to celebrate, but we don't have to wait until April. We don't have to wait until March to celebrate. Here in the first book of the Bible that Jesus, that God has given us, we see the gospel, we see the good news proclaimed. And so as we celebrate his coming into the world, we celebrate the serpent crusher. We celebrate the one who crushed the serpent's head. We celebrate it. He said, I've given authority to you to trample over snakes and scorpions. The only way he was able to give that power was because he was a serpent crusher himself. He said, I've given you the power to trample over because I will soon trample over the Satan's head. I will soon trample over the serpent's head. (sighs) To those who confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord, the power of death no longer rules over you. You are no longer under the dominion of death. Colossians says he has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light, the kingdom of his beloved son. If you are saved, you are no longer under that dominion anymore. You have no reason to be afraid of death. I know that in a season where death is running rampant, it can be scary. But understand that if you are a believer today, you have no reason to be afraid. That if you were to breathe your last breath today, if I were to breathe my last breath right now, I have no reason to be afraid because I know where I'm going. To those who shall be afraid, who should be afraid are those who don't know the Lord. They have no hope of eternal life. They're going to spend eternity somewhere, but it's not with the Lord. And so in this moment, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know the Savior, if he is not your Lord and Savior, I plead with you right now to not let this moment and this opportunity pass. You don't understand that the minute you, the minute you breathe your last breath, you either immediately with the Father, or in torment. And I wouldn't wish hell upon my greatest enemy. But look at what the Father has done. In their disobedience, he had a plan in motion from the beginning to redeem man. You don't have to die without him. You don't have to. This is why the son came through all of these generations to offer hope and eternal life. So I plead and I beg you right now, if you don't know the son, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, please, please, please text TCF1 to 94, excuse me, please text transform to 94000 right now. We can show you how to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It don't take work. All you have to do is believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and profess with your mouth genuinely that he is Lord and you will be saved. You will be saved from the eternal punishment of sin. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but you know that you strayed away, and I'm not just talking about not coming to church anymore. I'm talking about in your relationship, there has been It's been stagnant. There's been lack of devotion, lack of intimacy. You can come back today. You're still part of God's family, but you just acknowledge that my devotion has slipped. My intimacy has slipped. And I want to renew that commitment. I want to get back on track to follow the Lord. You can do that right now. You can text TRANSFORM to 94000. We have resources for you to show you how it doesn't take work. All it does All it takes is a renewed commitment to get back to seek his face, to get back into his word, and to to surround yourself with community who will empower you, who will encourage you in your moments of weakness, amen, who will encourage you to still seek him in the midst of what you're going through. And that's why I extend the offer to those of you who do not have a church home. You need community, amen. You were not created to live this life alone. I know we use Genesis 2. When the father says, says to Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. A lot of times we always think about that in the context of marriage, but in actuality, it's so much more broader. He's talking about community. He's just talking about relationship. So if you don't have community, 
if you don't have people that can pour into you and lead you, you're going to continue to be discouraged. But let us help you. Let us walk with you. We have life groups. We have resources. We would love to walk with you. You can text that same number. You can text hello TCF to 94000. And we would love to connect with you. Amen. Come on, celebrate Jesus tonight. Excuse me, this morning.